All right, so chapter 10 is on thermodynamics. So this is gonna be a thermal physics part of the um, book. So thermal physics is the study of temperature, heat, and how they affect matter. All right, so temperature is um, how hot or cold something feels when we touch it, right? So, um, which can be misleading because if you have a metal ice tray, it's gonna feel colder uh, to, to your hands versus you know a package of frozen vegetables that are at the exact same temperature. And that's because metal conducts thermal energy more rapidly than cardboard packaging does. So uh, thermal contact versus thermal equilibrium. So we do need to understand the differences between the two. So if you have two objects that are in contact with each other, heat can be exchanged between the two of those, right? So energy or heat can be exchanged between two objects that are in contact or touching each other, right? So two objects that are in thermal equilibrium, um, if they're in thermal contact, that means that there is no longer any exchange of energy or heat. All right, let's say we have object A here, uh, B here, and C in the middle. All right, even though object A and B are not in direct contact with each other, if the temperature of object A is equal to the temperature of C, and if the object of um, object C is equal to the temperature of B, then through these uh, two um, equality principles, we can also equate um, that A is also equal to B, even though they're not in direct contact with each other, um, because if the A and C are equal and C and B are equal, we can therefore um, say that A is also equal to B. All right, so this is called thermal thermal equilibrium, all right? Because although A and B are not touching, they are both equal to C. So if they're both equal to C, then all three are equal to each other, right? This is thermal equilibrium. That means there's no longer any heat exchange between them because it, it one is not higher than another. All right, everything is equal to each other. Now, thermal contact just means that they're touching. So A and C are touching and C and B are touching. So they're making thermal, thermal thermal contact. All right, so the ones that are touching each other are making thermal contact. And then although A and B are not touching each other directly, they are in thermal equilibrium because they are both in thermal equilibrium with C, which is the middle object between the two. All right, so heat and measurement. So the exchange of energy between two objects is because of the differences in their temperature, which is called heat. All right, so heat is an exchange of energy uh, between two objects. A thermometer is a device calibrated to measure the temperature of an object. All right, so there's different types of thermometers. You have alcohol-based, you have uh, mercury-based, which is being phased out. And then the more popular, what's being used today because of COVID is the laser-based thermometers. So those are the ones where you just aim at, uh, aim at whatever you're trying to measure and you can get um, a laser measurement from that thermometer, all right? Um, for the alcohol-based thermometers, uh, they use alcohol because alcohol has a uh, lower freezing temperature, all right? So, and mercury-based uh, thermometers are being phased out because mercury has been uh, proven to have cancerous uh, effects on the human body, so, all right? 
So zeroth law of thermodynamics is also called the law of equilibrium. So this is what I just showed you in the picture. If objects A and B are separated in thermal equilibrium with a third object C, then A and B are in equilibrium with each other. So those two objects in thermal equilibrium with each other are at that same temperature as well. So there's three scales of temperature. We have Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. The SI unit for temperature is Kelvin, not Celsius, not Fahrenheit. This is just what the US uses as its uh, measurement for temperature. However, in the scientific community, um, the international system of units for temperature is Kelvin. All right, so um, on the left picture is a comparison between Fahrenheit and Celsius. So water boils at 212 Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Celsius. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees Celsius. On the right picture here, we have a comparison between Celsius and Kelvin. All right, here are the temperature conversion formulas. All right. All right, thermal expansion. As temperature of the substance increases, the volume will also increase. So this is a direct correlation between temperature and volume. All right. If the volume goes up, we can assume that the temperature has increased slightly as well. Uh, this phenomenon is called thermal expansion. All right. So thermal expansion equation is the change in length. So delta again means change. So that's final minus initial is equal to uh, this Greek letter, uh, letter alpha stands for a constant and it varies from material to material. So the constant for steel would be different from the constant of silver or gold. All right. All right, so where you have L, this is the object's final length. L0 is the initial length. Sometimes you'll see it as LI instead of LO. Uh, they mean the same thing. And T is its final temperature, and T sub zero is um, the initial temperature. And the proportionality constant, uh, this is the uh, Greek letter for alpha, the alpha symbol. Why does this keep popping up? Um, it's also called the coefficient of linear expansion. And it has SI units of degrees Celsius um, to the minus one power. So degrees Celsius is in the denominator. All right, area expansion, same uh, science premise as volume expansion and length expansion. Um, you have uh, delta A just means the change in the area. So it's going to be your final area minus your initial area. Area. Uh, the symbol right here, Greek letter gamma, is called the coefficient of area expansion. Again, it varies from material to material. Right? Volume expansion is the same thing. Uh, delta V is your final velocity. I mean, sorry, final volume minus your initial volume is equal to the Greek letter beta, um, which is called the coefficient of volume expansion, which is also equal to three times the um, coefficient for length expansion, that alpha symbol right there. Um, and then you're multiplying that times the original volume times delta T, which is your change in temperature, final minus initial temperature. Uh, macroscopic uh, description of an ideal gas. So if you've taken, uh, this is either chemistry or biology, but if you remember the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT, uh, that's what they're describing here. This is the property of gases, all right? And it's important in thermodynamic processes. All right, so if we have gas in, in a container and it expands, to fill the container uniformly. It has pressure depending on the size of the container, the temperature and the amount of gas inside of the container. All right, so the larger the container, 
that pretty much leads to lower pressure and higher temperatures actually lead to um, higher pressure and then larger amounts of gas equal to higher pressure as well. So high temperature, large amounts of gas equal to higher pressure on the container that the gas is inside of. All right, so equation of state, uh, P is pressure, V is volume, temperature is T, the amount of gas in the container, uh, we usually call that moles. Uh, the equation can be complicated, but it's, it's supposed to be relatively simple if we're talking about a gas that's at low pressure or low density. All right, so this is, these are approximations. So it doesn't, it's not perfect, I should say that. So it doesn't qualify for each and every gas. Okay, so that's why they call it ideal gases. All right, so an ideal gas is a collection of atoms or molecules that move randomly and exert no long range force on each other. Okay, so like we discussed in chapter six about collision between particles, the collision is shortly lived. It happens in the split of a second and then they go on about their way and bump into other things. Okay, so the collisions don't, between the gas particles don't last long. Uh, Avogadro's number, um, this is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, power. And this is a representation of the particles uh, per uh, mole inside of a certain gas or a number of particles. Now, let's see. So you've been introduced to Avogadro number before if you've already taken chemistry and maybe even biology as well. So the number of uh, moles is expressed by M, which is the mass over the molar mass. So the molar mass of a substance is defined as the mass of one mole of that substance, and it's usually expressed in grams per mole. All right, so this is the ideal gas law. PV is equal to nRT, again, where P is your pressure, V is your volume, N is your number of moles, R is the universal gas constant, which um, there's two here, and you would use uh, one or the other depending on the SI units of the other components in the equation. Okay, and then uh, R, again, your universal gas constant, and then T is your temperature. Again, your temperature, the SI unit for temperature is Kelvin, not Celsius, not Fahrenheit. All right. Uh, let's do that. Uh, here I have Boltzmann constant here, which is the um, ideal gas law divided by Avogadro's number, which comes out to be 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd. Uh, joules over Kelvin. Uh, assumptions of the kinetic theory for an ideal gas. All right, so these are the five assumptions here. Number one says the number of molecules in the gas is large and the average separation between them is large compared to their dimensions. Two, the molecules obey Newton's law of motion, right? Uh, but as a whole, they move randomly. Number three, the molecules interact only through short range forces during elastic collisions. So that's what we discussed in chapter six between elastic and inelastic collisions. So elastic means uh, the molecules retain their shape. So there's no deformation in the change of the particle once it bumps into another particle. Number four, the molecules make elastic collisions with the walls as well as each other. Um, number five, all molecules in the gas are identical. So you're not going to have, you know, a mixture of different gases. That's what the ideal gas theory states. 